There's something special about it and I can't always explain it, but once you see it, you'll know it. Unless they're literally crossing the road in front of you, you don't see them. They're just such an incredible, unique animal. I always say they just bewitch you. Knowledge is critical. We know almost nothing about these animals. I think I can comfortably say at least 65 to 70 percent of the world's population doesn't know about a pangolin and why it's so important. Like most people, I didn't know much about pangolins. So when Johan asked me to make a pangolin film with him, my first question was why? I did know that you hardly ever see them in the wild. I mean, Johan grew up in the bush and has spent his life making films there, and he still hadn't ever seen one. Then he told me about the illegal wildlife trade. It's almost wiped out the four Asian species and is now coming for the African pangolins, making them more trafficked than any other mammal on Earth. This got my attention. I wanted to know more about these odd little animals that are on the verge of extinction. Once we'd agreed to make the film, we decided to do something that had never been done before. Get all four species of African pangolin into one film. It would mean traveling from South Africa deep into some of Africa's remotest areas. But we began our search at home. You got something? Probably in the same place it was last night. Wendy's been tracking and studying the Timmings ground pangolin for the past three years. These animals exist all over Southern Africa. And in spite of being very difficult to find, they're now being poached and sold into the illegal wildlife trade in rapidly increasing numbers. So you think that's where he is? No, I think he's in that burrow over there. He probably won't come straight out of the burrow, so he'll probably come out the side, so... But he's probably going to go straight into a bush. Very likely going to go out of the burrow and straight into the bushes. <laughs> and now? You just wait. And now we wait. The wait begins. Just the fact that he's so relaxed means I can follow him and watch him do his natural behaviors without me influencing it at all. And being able to gain that information is really important if we're trying to understand what these guys do in their natural habitat. I started following this guy about three years ago. So the bond is, is fairly strong. It's a strong bond, yeah. He's, I shouldn't have a favorite, but he's my favorite. <laughs> We know that they're under a threat at the moment and the numbers are declining at a rapid rate. And if we want to be able to manage that and conserve that, we need to understand that animal. So the research that anybody is doing is going to be really vital to contribute to the understanding of that animal. The massive spike in the illegal wildlife trade in African pangolins in the last two years has made it essential to learn about this animal as quickly as possible, if we want to save it. A new book about the trade came out while we were making the film. Poached is written by New York journalist Rachel Neuer. Her story is told through exhaustive first-hand reporting. Rachel's encounters with the traditional medicine black markets in China and poachers and wild meat restaurants in Vietnam bring home the stark reality of the trade. Her investigations paid particular attention to pangolins. We go way back, me and pangolins. In 2010, I was doing my research for my ecology masters. 
in Vietnam. And already at that time, pangolins were being absolutely hammered by the illegal trade. When I came back to the UK to present my research findings, I gave you know a 20 minute presentation on what I'd been doing in Vietnam. And the first question I got at the end of my presentation was, what's a pangolin? And I was like, oh, wow. And this is a room full of ecologists and ecology students. A lot of this trade is just happening with absolute impunity. I showed up for one day in a Chinese market in Guangzhou, China, and within an hour, I was able to find a bag of illegal pangolin scales. And you know, clearly, I don't fit in there, and I don't speak Chinese, and yet it was not that difficult. So seeing that for myself really showed me how far we have to come in, in tackling this trade. All wrapped up in his blanket. <laughs> When pangolins in South Africa are recovered from the trade, they're rehabilitated by people like Nikki Wright, a specialist wildlife vet. She's also executive director of the African Pangolin Working Group, established in 2011. It's a dedicated team involved in education, rehabilitation, enforcement, and legislation around the conservation of pangolins and their habitat. Last year, there was 48 tons of African pangolin scales intercepted in Asia by their customs officials, 48 tons. You think each animal has maybe 70 scales on them. It's a lot of animals. They don't weigh much. Nikki was briefing anti-poaching unit trainees about a pangolin she was about to release back into the wild. The pangolin's name was Umkumboti, or Umi as she became known. She got her name because the poacher who'd captured her had kept her in a plastic drum filled with homemade beer called Umkumboti. Two weeks probably is the minimum that they spend with us at the hospital. They're all compromised, so they've all been in captivity for a week or 10 days without any food. And she had traveled like that all the way from Mozambique. So we had to wash her and get her all cleaned up. But luckily she's okay. And so now she's desperate to get out. So we put her telemetry on her yesterday. So um, Rigan and his team are going to be tracking her because it's all very well fixing animals and flinging them out. And it's a nice feeling, but you need to know what happens to them afterwards. She's foraging. Well, she's starting. She's looking for food. They've got an amazing sense of smell. I've walked behind a pangolin, and then suddenly it's stopped, and it's turned due left, and it's walked for 20 meters and started digging there. They can smell ants that far. It's amazing. She's absolutely fine to go. There's going to be no problem, hopefully. Dr. Cleo Graf helped us understand the ecological reasons why the pangolin should be saved. In ecological terms, a keystone species is something that has an impact greater than you would expect for its biomass in the system. Which brings me to pangolin and aardvark, both of which we know so little about. Through their feeding on ants and termites and therefore potentially controlling their populations, they change the landscape. If you take something like a pangolin out of the system, we really don't know what impact that would have on ants and termites. Would they become super abundant? There was a very nice study done in Venezuela. They flooded a valley and formed these different sized islands. Some of the islands became completely denuded, stripped of everything, and others functioned normally. What they discovered that in the completely stripped islands, the leaf cutter ants became completely super abundant and just stripped everything. And so without the anteaters that control those leaf cutter ant populations, the entire system just fell apart. So we just don't know if we took pangolins out of a system, what the knock-on effects would be, but my guess would be huge. Just getting the frequency right. A few days after her release, Umi went missing. The monitoring team lost contact with her telemetry signal. 
It's crucial to know that a released pangolin has survived those first few days. So Professor Ray Janssen, chairman of the African Pangolin Working Group, came down to help find her. So we're fortunate to go up in one of the anti-poaching aircraft that normally monitor for uh, rhino poaching. So we hopefully get to about 1,000 to 1,500 foot and we should be able to pick her up with the line of sight within 30 kilometers of uh, this young female pangolin, which seems to be heading straight back to Mozambique where she came from. Okay. Might looking. be a few little bumps if you don't mind. That's okay. Um, I was up in a chopper last week, so and that was pretty bumpy. Yeah, but th that stuff's unstable. It's not dangerous, it's just a bit it's bumpy. It's just bumpy. Yeah. I'll just try not to throw up in your cockpit. I've got a sick bag if you do. Okay, that might be helpful. We'll do a circular so we can get a triangulation. And then I'll do a drop pin to the ground crew and uh, go try and find it. Prof Janssen's role in the African Pangolin Working Group means that he's often directly responsible for retrieving pangolins from the illegal wildlife trade in Southern Africa. It is organized crime and it's highly organized and there are syndicates operating and there are Asian syndicates. So it's deep underground, it's the same level rhino and pelamon and elephant ivory are being traded, but we haven't had any success breaking into them. <laughs> <laughs> the 48 tons we seized last year leaving the African continent and the 23 tons we seized this year so far leaving the African continent in terms of pangolin scales is, represents 8 to 10 percent of the actual trade. Thinking about it, pangolins are the perfect animals to traffic. Natural instinct to roll into a ball a piece of wire around it, throw it on the back of the bucket. You don't need to worry about it, it's not going anywhere. Unfortunately, that mechanism of them, of them wanting to protect themselves is one of their biggest downfalls. Andrew Jackson is head of an anti-poaching unit, focused mainly on rhinos. But he volunteered to help rehabilitate a young female pangolin whose mother died on an electric fence. Sadly, electric fences cause approximately 1,000 pangolin deaths in South Africa every year. So I, I had the privilege and the opportunity to, to raise an orphaned pangolin baby called Electra. Uh, when I received her, she was just on 1.9 kilos. At that age, she still needs a, a, a parental figure, a mother. So my job uh, was a babysitter. I was her mom, in fact. I had to take her out twice a day, at least, for about one and a half to two hours, and find nests for her to feed on, and just completely fell in love with her. She was the most amazing animal I've ever encountered. At the beginning, I would actually take her to her ant nest and put her down and off you go, girl. And she would just move off. She wouldn't feed on those ants that I'd picked and she would go find her own ants. And she became incredibly picky in what species of ants she was feeding on. At one stage, she only wanted to eat ant eggs. So I had to go and find ant eggs. And as you can imagine, it's not the easiest thing in the world to, to find ant nests, n never mind just the nest, but then to actually find the ant chambers. Their ability to smell those, those ants and those eggs like anything up to 30 centimetres underground yeah. is just absolutely mind-blowing. I'm not a pangolin expert by any stretch of the imagination. And I was learning from her every second I spent with her. If she tasted something that really tasted ugly, her entire tongue would come out and she'd actually tie it in a knot and she'd use her tongue to squeeze this taste off that she didn't like and she would start frothing a little bit and you would realise that there was something in the nest that she didn't like and she would move off and she would go to the next nest. Her personality was amazing. She was, she was vibrant, she was full of go, and, she, and just so relaxed. She was so comfortable with, with people. And um, at one stage, I kind of thought we made a connection. Uh, we'd be walking around in the bush, and it's probably me just looking into it way too much. But she would follow me. She was associating me with getting food, and probably that, that's the reason. I thought that we had a unique connection. She was just an amazing, amazing creature. I, I really cherished every single second that I was with her. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really sad story and something pure. <laughs> that that oof, really gets to me. Um, unfortunately, she, she passed away. Um, we're not sure why. We, we're surmising maybe that at that age, they still are drinking milk. They still need that, that mother's milk that they're feeding on. And which we weren't giving her. We, we, we weren't uh, able to give her. Um, so she, she, she didn't slowly decline. It was an amazing thing. She just 
overnight just dropped. And this is how in tune you get to them. As I opened the box, I knew there was something wrong, immediately. She was limp, lethargic, uh, she was really cold. We raced through to, to meet a veterinarian and they put her on, on a drip and uh, put uh, the saline into her and, and tried to get her glucose levels up. And she kind of maintained for about a week and then she just crashed, crashed and passed away. So although it's, a, it's an incredibly sad event, we're learning so much just from her. You know, for future pangolins, she could be one that, what we've learned from her could save pangolins in the future that are in the similar, similar type of situation that get brought in, specifically from the, the, uh, the, the trade now with pangolins. The mothers are being caught with babies. And these babies now, we're learning how to be able to rehab them back to the wild, which is vitally important. Meanwhile, the search for the missing Umi was continuing on the ground. Ray had picked up her signal from the plane the previous evening, and now he was trying to pinpoint her exact position so they could check on her condition. A man can noch boom klim. I've got a feeling she's heading Mozambique way. Should we go? Can we get up to that copy? We can, yeah. I've got a feeling she's heading, and she's been going northeast ever since. Let's try that because the GPS was. They are struggling with that pin drop for about five minutes. So we had to turn the plane around. So there's a pin and we are here. Okay. So that means we're going to have to go on that road. Okay. Follow it to the left side. Okay. And then we're going to end up right there by the pin. Okay, awesome. I got involved with the African Bangalore Working Group about three, four months ago. Um, when there was a sting operation in the area between various law enforcement agencies regarding a pangolin. I had the opportunity to work with a, a live pangolin the first time ever. I spent quite some time in the bush and I've, I've never seen one, you know. Um, and to be able to, to follow and monitor and do some research on a pangolin, you know, it's, it's just, I can't describe it. If we carry on with this cut line, we're going to get to quite a high ground. It's got like a solar panel four-way, but it's quite a high ground. But you scan basically the whole of the west. Okay? We can't get her there, then she's gone to Mozambique. It's bad not finding her, but at least we know she's moving. Eh? She is. <laughs> you don't get to see them a lot, and that's why it's so difficult to do research on them. And we're fighting a war where they're getting traded, and they might go extinct before we realized what's going on with them and what's the, the importance within our whole system. I got a phone Have you got a signal? Yes, that's fine. Holy crap. I've got a faint. Yeah, I can hardly I can hardly hear it. That very dense part of the comp as it comes round. Straight there. Find her. Yeah, found her. She's just curled up on the side of a bush and not even in a hole, just chilling there. Good news, eh? She's travelled how far you reckon? Between six and eight k's. It's about it's about Seven, nine to ten, eh? Because in, in forty-eight hours. <clears throat> forty-eight hours. That's huh? huge. A big time. For an animal that just walks on two legs very slowly. And we've seen lots of her foraging signs, her field signs, so she's obviously finding food. And she's tucked up in the shade of a bush here and doing fun. You lose so many and then you, mm. you get this and, and it's all worthwhile, even if it's one. Rian is going to carry on following her and monitoring her. And it's just the most rewarding thing to see this animal in her environment. Um, They go through the most horrific time. They're starving, they've been ripped out of their beautiful existence. 
and terrified at the hands of the poachers. Um, they've been abused, they've been pushed and shoved and looked at and shouted over and haggled over and, and eventually the lucky ones come through to us. Um, so to see her here is very moving. And I'm just so grateful that we've had a part in, in making her better and getting her to where she needs to be so that she can carry on. Someone else who's been caring for pangolins for nearly 27 years at the Tiki Highwood Foundation in Zimbabwe is Lisa Highwood. She loves all types of wildlife but pangolins have a special place in her heart. So October 1994, I received my first call from the authorities. They said that um, an animal had been confiscated and would I please go and recover the animal and then start the process of rehabilitation. And um, I had to drive about two and a half hours to where the location was. And when I got there, I was on the side of the road. I'd handed over a sack. Being given an animal in a sack, I don't know why, but that really had major ramifications at that moment for me. Uh, and then when I looked and I saw this one eye staring at me, um, my world stood still. Since that moment, the Tiki Highwood Foundation has grown to become a major influence in pangolin conservation all over Africa. People will say, oh, in Africa, forget it. You're never gonna overcome that. It's just how it is. Well, I disagree with that. But what works in Canada or the UK may not actually work in Zimbabwe or in South Africa. Let's do what's right for Africa. Because these are African problems. And therefore, we have to find African solutions. If we lose the pangolin, we lose the Earth's great gardeners. They are our caretakers. And for me, they are my essence. exist in very remote areas. So to find the second African pangolin on our list, it took us two long days to get to Western Ghana. We were hoping to see the white-bellied tree pangolin. The study is also about knowing the ectoparasites of the white belly pangolin. So any pangolin that we release or tag, we take out the ectoparasite on its body. So for instance, this is the ectoparasite. So we determine the type of ectoparasite that are on these pangolins. Max will spend 10 years studying in South Africa before returning home to Ghana. So he could concentrate on an animal that he was clearly passionate about conserving. Axel's project requires that he establish pangolin numbers in Ghana. To do this, he needs access to the bushmeat trade. Any information I want about bushmeat trade, I can come to them. So they are the ones who initially informed me about the Chinese trade, their purchase of the skill. So these guys have come to buy the skill. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. And these are the scales from the pangolin? Yeah. So this is the white-bellied pangolin. Oh. It's amazing, this is what it's all about, actually. The bushmeat trade also provides him with an opportunity to gather DNA samples as he builds his database on the pangolin commodity chain. Based on my experience and our research so far with African Pangolin Working Group, we've realized that the processing of the pangolin meat is different. Those who are aware of the Chinese trade of scale, they remove it with hot water. Those who are not aware, they just bend the scale. So these guys are not aware of the trade in pangolin scale. For many years, the traditional bushmeat trade has been sustainable. However, recent studies have begun to question this 
particularly in the light of the illegal trade in pangolins. The next day, we headed into the forest to release a pangolin that the guards had brought to Maxwell for his research. Basically, with my home range studies, the guards assist me in uh, getting the pangolins to put a tag on. So what you do is you do a night patrol because they come out at night, that is when they feed. The plan is to release it near a log where there are some ants so that it'll remain in the area and hopefully begin to feed and we can get some footage of our first wild pangolin in the, in the forest. <laughs> it still wants to be in the defensive position. So we are about to release it uh, where it was caught. So can I ask you a personal question? Why are you doing it? Yeah, I'm doing it because I'm interested in what I do. And I like pangolin. I've become fascinated about the animal. That actually motivates me that there's a lot to study. The third pangolin that we wanted to film is the smallest and has a reputation for being the cutest. Again, it took more than two days to get to the forest in the Central African Republic where we hoped to find them. The trip took months to set up, but finally we were off to meet Rod and Tamar Cassidy, who run a pangolin rehabilitation program at their eco lodge. In 2003, I was due to come and do a recce here, and they had a coup d'etat. So I came in 2004 and fell in love with the place. We'd crossed the river from Cameroon, uh, and as we were driving through the village, um, a bunch of people were running through the fields, and uh, a pangolin ran out into the road in front of us. And uh, I jumped out of the car and these guys were all chasing it and one of the guys grabbed it and I just grabbed it from him and got back in the car. <laughs> that was the first pangolin I'd, I'd ever seen technically in the wild. Mm. And we brought it back to the camp here and released it. It was a black-bellied pangolin mm. and, and we didn't even know that these things were diurnal. We thought all pangolins were nocturnal like everybody thought at that stage. And so we, we waited, waited till it got dark to release it. <laughs> we released it like at six o'clock at night. You know, the thing was going, oh shit, it's dark now. I've got to go find a place to sleep. Yeah. So we, we've learned a lot since then. Tracking pangolins with telemetry is not an option in the forest here. So Rod and Tamar have hit on a novel solution. They've trained teams of local Baaka tribesmen to monitor the black-bellied tree pangolins that have been rehabilitated and returned to the forest. The Baaka follow the pangolins from sunrise to sunset every day as they feed in the treetops high above. They record pangolin behavior, their movements, and what they eat. We spent a day with them watching Pangi, a favorite of Tamar's. Yes, yes. He's right at the top. I just saw the movement and that was there. But that's what happens. They'll disappear in there for hours. <laughs> you won't see them, you just know that they're eating. The best is seeing her high up, going from tree to tree to tree. And I could do this all the time. I mean, I have sat and watched and watched and watched. And something that draws you in. And I thought, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen now? Oh. Yeah, so there was always something to do, some question to answer. I've got to know what they eat, what area they're in. The habitat, there's still lots of questions on it. 
be why you can watch them forever. Yeah. When the rain stopped, we met Maya, a Swiss researcher who is living at the lodge and running the pangolin rehabilitation program that Rod and Tamar set up. Ndima was a rescued pangolin who'd been returned to the forest, but while being monitored, his team noticed that he didn't seem to be as strong as he should be. He started slipping off branches and coming down to the ground to sleep. So Maya and the Baaka have brought him in for observation and some feeding up. Nick. Yeah. And here. It's like <laughs> the Baaka spend many hours harvesting ants from trees in the forest so that Ndima can put on weight as quickly as possible and return to the treetops. So what we're going to do is now he's going to walk uh, with the pangolin and find some ant nest and just follow really him. Deep, yeah. yeah. You're a bit concerned that he hasn't fully recovered his strength. Yeah, no, he hasn't. He hasn't for sure. He used to be much stronger and much steady and confident in going up the, the branches. They do fall, but he he now falls like every day, a couple mm -hmm. of times. We're gonna watch him the whole day, and then at the end of the day, that's where when the bark is gonna hopefully climb a little bit and take him carefully. Yes. Everyone, everyone who comes into contact with him, everyone who works with him, Isn't somehow it? gets connected. Mm -hmm. I wonder what it is. Do you I, know? I, I, there's something mystical. Mm. Poaching and the illegal wildlife trade have not yet hit this backwater. But with Cameroon, a pangolin poaching hotspot just across the river, Rod, Tamar and Maya are very aware that it won't be long before their little black-bellied pangolins are under threat. giant ground pangolin is notoriously shy and elusive. There are very few recorded sightings anywhere in Africa. Pangolin researchers have struggled for years to find them, and we'd given ourselves a week. Many people simply laughed out loud when we told them this. We hoped to get lucky. Eventually, we made contact with Vianette in Gabon who'd taken a group of tourists into the forests last year and literally stumbled over not one, but two giants. Gislan was their tracker. The giant pangolin is very difficult to observe because, first of all, it's nocturne. nocturnal. When we see the traces, whether it's a pangolin, and surtout for us, it was surtout impressionant. It was surtout a good thing. night one of our search for the giant brown pangolin. We are going to be here for at least this week, but tonight is the beginning of our quest. It's a pangolin. Yeah, it's a pangolin. Not fresh. So we've got tracks here of the pangolin, but um, Apparently they're not fresh, so we're in the area, but not recent. The rest of that week became a blur as night two rolled into nights three and four. We hacked and hiked night after night. Or rather it was Gislan who hacked and the rest of us hiked. We became disoriented by the claustrophobic feelings that the forest and the darkness and the lights and the cacophony of night sounds had on us. What kept us going night after night and through the long, hot, humid days in between were the signs that the giant was definitely there. This is clear indication that there has been a giant 
This guy is here. He's all around us. <laughs> and we're gonna find him. So this was last night? Yeah, last night. The pangolin eat the, the termite here. <laughs> so, yeah. it's a, like a play. It's like a game. <laughs> and who's winning the game? For the moment, it's the pangolin. <laughs> yeah. Bon, la, la première de fois, bon, ça je vous le dis, j'ai pleuré. La première fois que j'ai entendu parler de, de Chinois, lorsqu'il faisait, le, en fait, lorsqu'il, c'était au Cameroun, lorsqu'on a fait la formation de la reconnaissance du métier d'éco-guide, j'avais pleuré parce qu'on nous avait montré une image là où il y avait presque 3 à 600 pangolins qui ont été... Bon, pas, les Chinois n'ont pas tué, mais ils sont partis dans les villages, ils ont donné de l'argent en disant, nous, on veut ça. Et je lance vraiment un appel euh, à nos gouvernements, surtout, surtout, de, de ne pas négliger cette histoire. Parce que si ces espèces disparaissent, ce qui est sûr, la forêt va aussi mourir. It's night five in our search for the giant pangolin and we've moved to a completely different area in the forest. Uh, one last roll of the dice, so to speak. And we're in a riverine area. Beautiful, beautiful location for, for giant pangolin, apparently. She's laying, is giving it its all, diving headfirst into everything that it looks like. It might be a burrow. Eventually, we realized that we weren't going to find the giant that night, or even on that trip. Very difficult. Yeah, very, very difficult. Yeah. 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 But thank you for trying. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we didn't give ourselves enough time after all. But what would have been enough time? On our last day in the forest, we went to meet researcher Dr. David Lehman, who's lived in Gabon for the past few years. He told us about his plan for a giant pangolin study project. By understanding a bit more about the ecology, about where they are, uh, what is the distribution uh, range of these species, then we'll be able to gather valuable information to protect uh, them better as well. What I want to do first is to put a GPS tag and a BHF tags on an individual. So the first uh, step was to um, find one. <laughs> so we set up a lot of uh, camera trap, uh, 42 actually, uh, with a lot of video. We could identify one big male and then we narrow it down to his uh, home ranges, to his territory. And now we have uh, 12 of his uh, sleeping sites uh, that are being monitored by camera trapping. Uh, this guy is, is, is huge, I think he's over 30 kilograms. We already have good indications about uh, his uh, spatial ecology, I would say. Uh, we also have nice behavior. Uh, actually, he's got a female now with him. Uh, so I think there is a bit of uh, shaky shaky going on which is great for the species. <laughs> if successful, David Lehman's project to study the giant will be one of the first of its kind. And even though we didn't find one, it felt good to get this close. Maybe next time. Hopefully there'll be a next time.
It's clear that the pangolins of Africa are in the eye of a poaching storm. There's no doubt that they're in serious trouble. No one knows exactly how serious, but the signs are not good. They've been around for over 80 million years, but it looks as if they could disappear in our lifetime. And we've done that. Us. People. But it's also people who've inspired us throughout the making of this film. It's through them that we've come to know a little bit more about the pangolins of Africa. And it's people who can save them. So we might be sitting here right now and talking about pangolin, but what we are facing is far greater than that. We have to get involved. Everybody's responsible. Humankind is responsible. I mean, Mother Nature is struggling. She's shouting. We're just not listening. Is there hope? You know, the business of conservation has to be run by optimists, because if you're a pessimist, you're going to commit suicide. You have to be optimistic, tenacious and optimistic. So yes, I think there's hope, but I'm an optimist.